Now, Pastor Jeff is going to be bringing the word, so let's all stand and let's welcome him to the house of, of God. Come on, Pastor Jeff. Love you too. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. So excited to be here with you guys. Um, you know, uh, we, we've been up actually quite a bit the last few weeks. We've had a lot going on in our household. We're here to, uh, we have a, a leadership conference, a Raymond retreat we're going to, and one of our daughters got married a couple of weeks ago. And no, it wasn't Mackenzie. It wasn't Mackenzie, so don't worry. I keep telling Mackenzie, you tell that tall, hairy guy not to ask me yet, because the answer's gonna be no. Not ready to give away my baby girl yet. And uh, so you guys may, I need some backup since we're not here all the time, so maybe you guys can help me with that. I don't know where he is right now, David, but uh, we'll see how long that lasts. But David's a good guy. Um, we love him, and I love picking on him. So, uh, and he can't pick back because he doesn't have the microphone. So that's, that's always good. But we love being with our tree family. Um, our, 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 well, our Bola Vida is, is doing well. Um, our church is doing great. Uh, we opened a second location back in January, or we took over a church, I should say. Um, that, so we have two locations. We have a West Campus, which is actually getting ready to launch two services. So they've been meeting. Uh, they've had one service, but they're growing now, and so they're fixing to start two services. Um, but God's good. He's been faithful. Um, a lot going on. I wish I could talk about, I could talk about Mexico this whole time. But, uh, but I'm not, I do have a message for you. Uh, and we just kicked off our eighth year of RAMA, which is our ministry training center that we have, um, eight years. And we have five pastors this year, which is really, really amazing. Uh, that's, that is our heart to train pastors and leaders to do the work of the ministry and to help churches in Mexico and, and where we're at in Leon, help these pastors. Uh, most of them have no formal education to speak of. So it's, it's uh, you know, when they, when they start a church, they just, some of the, you know, they're very legalistic, very religious, and so we want to have influence in their lives so that they, so that they can uh, be trained in ministry, doctrine, and all those kind of things so that they can have a life-giving church, a growing church. And so uh, this year, it was just, we broke through some barriers, some walls, and we have five pastors uh, from the local area, and you guys are sponsoring some of those pastors. So, yeah, thank you. And uh, so we're so thankful for that. And Rayma is, uh, obviously, we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, facilitating their campus. Um, so we're excited. A lot of our leaders in our church are graduates of Rayma of our campus. So um, God's really doing some amazing things there. Those of you who've been following our orphanage project, um, we've been kind of tied up in this limbo with uh, land that was, that was donated to us about four years ago. And out of the blue, a couple months ago or so, uh, we got a phone call. We were ready to kind of give up on this project. You know, well, maybe it's just, you know, maybe it's just not meant to be. And then we get a call out of the blue. Hey, the land is yours. I'm like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> so we're excited about that. All that has gone. Well, there's one little thing we have to do yet. We have to uh, next week. Um, we're doing an outreach. They wanted us to do an outreach so the uh, government, uh, the people from the state can come and see what we do in the community firsthand. And so we have a big outreach the following week, and which is kind of the last thing they just want to see. And once they, they come and see what we're doing, then that's kind of the last signature we have on this piece of paper, and it'll officially be ours. It's already written in our name, but they haven't signed off on it just yet. So we're like, it's close. And so keep that in prayer. Um, we know that, that that's a God thing, and so we'll keep you updated on, on the progress of that as we go along. Um, next month is our 12-year anniversary. God has done some incredible things in 12 years. Uh, amen. We started, we started Arbo de Vida from scratch, and it's amazing to see what God's done in 12 years. And I love that tree of life, the vision for Arbo de Vida, uh, that from tree of life, the vision for Arbo de Vida was born and really God was preparing tree some kind of, some 40 years ago when tree first started ministering in Mexico and I think it was maybe our second year of tree of life when we took our first trip to Mexico and my mom she just fell in love with Mexico fell in love with the people the ministry there and it's always been you guys know it's always been a big part of the heart of tree of life and so I stand here today my wife and I super super blessed and honored that God sent us to central Mexico from tree to continue the vision and plant an audible to the church. So, uh, so we're super excited, super blessed, super thankful for that. We are one church, 
one heart, but now three different uh, expressions, Tree of Life Mexico North Campus, West Campus, and Tree of Life Texas. So I, it's just, I think that's just awesome. Amen. So thank you for supporting us and investing so much in expanding the kingdom of God in Mexico. We could not do what we do without your support. Uh, but I'm excited to share the word with you today. Uh, God has been stirring, really stirring a series in my heart for a few weeks that, uh, that I'm, I'm, I plan on launching in our church in a couple of weeks. But I had it on my heart to share part of that with you today. And so the title of my message today is Shadow Boxing, Surrendering to Discipline. And uh, I know everybody's like, oh, discipline, no, 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 no. Yeah, but it's really a foundational idea for growing spiritually when we talk about growing spiritually. And so today I wanna to start by asking, asking you a question. How many sports lovers do we have in the room? Yeah, really, that's all, it's like 10 people. <laughs> Everyone else is like, no, I don't, sports, who cares? And, but, uh, you know, we, I'm sure we have lots of sports. We're a sports family. We're a sports-loving family. Baseball was our sport when we were growing up. My dad was always the coach of our baseball teams. Uh, my brother and I, man, we lived and breathed baseball. My mom was always there uh, as well, practicing with us while my dad was on the road. So it, it, even in, in my family, all of my kids grew up playing sports, especially my girls. They were amazing softball players. Uh, and so, and I always coached their teams. And I remember growing up, my, my grandfather used to take us to Kansas City Chiefs games and Kansas City Royals games. So I don't know if we have any Kansas City fans here. Well, I'm still a huge Kansas City fan. I'm also a Dallas fan, so don't worry. Uh, but last Sunday's game was amazing. If you saw that game, it was amazing. Anyway, so a couple of years ago, I was, I was able to, uh, uh, I guess maybe two, three years ago, uh, I was able to take my wife and Mackenzie to their first professional football game, Kansas City Chiefs. And so it was so much fun. And you know, there's nothing like being in a stadium, being there live at the game, right? I mean, it's just not the same as watching it on TV. But I have a funny story. How many Spurs fans do we have? Woo, woo, I'm a Spurs fan. And that's not my funny story, but uh, <laughs> Tree, uh, back in the day, years ago, Tree had a men's event and it was going to the Spurs game. So we all went to the Spurs game, and one of my best friends was with me that night. And at halftime, he disappeared. And I thought, hey, he's probably loading up on all the snacks and whatever, hot dogs and Cokes. And, and you know how halftime is at the games, they have some fun games on the court, something to entertain the crowd all the time. And so this time they had, uh, at this game, they had selected three random people out of the thousands of people that were there that night. And what they did was each contestant had to sing a Beatles song. And the one with the loudest fan applause uh, obviously was the winner. And they won some prizes, another thing. And so the first guy goes and they announce his name, where he's from. And so he, do, you know, they start playing the song. And so he did okay. Uh, you know, wasn't a great singer or anything. And the second person goes and she's like way better than the first guy. So she got huge applause. And then it's time for the last contestant. And so you hear the announcer He's like, and our last contestant, Jeff Duncan from New Braunfels, Texas. And it was my friend, and he had given them my name. And so, so he's like, he starts singing, and he's so bad. He's so terrible. He doesn't even know the words to the beat. It's like a really popular tune, and he doesn't even know the words to it. And he's just like, ah, nah, nah, nah. you know, it sounded terrible and make, making stuff up. And... <laughs> Can't sing of his life dependent on it. And the whole stadium is booing. There's like thousands and thousands of people booing Jeff Duncan from New Braunfels, Texas. <laughs> I'm like, I was mortified. You know, I, I, I was like, man, I hope nobody thinks that's actually me that knows me. And so, but we're Spurs fans. We love going to the games, football, baseball, whatever. We love sports. And, and you love sports because they're fun in and of themselves, really, right? But there's also something else with sports that's so appealing. There are some great stories and, and, and there's some great lessons that are connected to sports. Um, I mean, I love all the sports, you know, the comeback movies, the underdog movies, all those kind of things. In fact, there was a great lesson that we saw last year during the Summer, Olympic game, uh, the Summer Olympics. And in one of the women's weightlifting categories, there was a Chinese athlete that was the predicted favorite. And actually, we have a photo here. She was the predicted favorite. And she was known by everybody, apparently around the world in this category, and she was favored to win. I mean, there was no question, no doubt about it. However, last year the Olympics were, were different because 
uh, they were different in the fact that we all had experienced the, the lockdowns of COVID. And so this meant that athletes couldn't do their normal routines, workout routines, gym, and all that kind of thing. So they had to be very creative in the way that they planned and prepared for the Olympics. So meanwhile, in the Philippines, there was another athlete. And I think we have her photo. Her name was Heidelin uh, uh, Diaz. And so this is, this is the way that she prepared when her gym was closed and she couldn't use normal weights. She used bottles of water and, and weighted bags to, to prepare for, for the Olympics. Now, what you have to understand about about her is that the Philippines up to this point had never won a gold medal in the Olympics. And, but this year, Heidelin Diaz outdid all the other competitors. And let's see the next photo there. And at the Olympics, she won the first gold medal for the Philippines, ever. First gold medal ever. And that, that, that's why I love sports, because I love stories. I love stories just like that. But I also love something else. There's a lesson here because there, you know, in, in this story, there, there was a clear favorite, but yet somebody else won. And there's a lesson about discipline. And in fact, I think the lesson really is this, that discipline trumps talent in almost every area of our lives. It does. I mean, think about it. Discipline will trump talent in almost every area of our lives. And, and, and it will lead to winning it will lead to victory. It will lead to success. And I'm convinced that's why the Apostle Paul was always challenging us to be disciplined. Not a, if you've read uh, any of his writings, and, and not as athletes, but in our spiritual walk and in our spiritual journey. It's so important. In fact, all throughout his letters in the New Testament, he was always using uh, Olympic language and, and, and athletic language. Uh, Always, and there was a reason for that. Obviously, the, the people of that day were very familiar with the Olympic Games. They happened in Athens, Greece. But actually, there was another set of Olympic-type games that took place the summer before the Olympic Games and the summer after the Olympic Games. And those games were called the Isthmian, Isthmian Games. And these games took place in, in, in Corinth, a place where Paul wrote his letters to the Corinthian church. I just think that's interesting. And in those letters, he encouraged us to be disciplined spiritually. Because here's the thing, if we can be disciplined spiritually, then we're going to thrive spiritually. And that's, that, that's gonna overflow into all the other areas of our life. Do you realize that? And, and when we're disciplined spiritually, it's going to overflow into, into our marriage. When we're disciplined spiritually, it's gonna overflow into our homes and, and, and to our children. When we're disciplined spiritually, it's, it's gonna overflow into our relationships, our workplace, right? And literally every area of our life. So he encourages us, be disciplined in your faith. Be disciplined spiritually. And in fact, this is what he says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 24. He says, don't you realize that in a race, and here he is with the athletic Olympic terminology, Everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to what? Win. Run to win. And those of us who love sports and love competition, man, we like that terminology. We like that verbiage. It's like, oh, man, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm there. That's the only way to participate, right? I mean, if we win, we're, we're in it to win it. We like to win. But again, he's using this metaphor in order to encourage us. He's not talking about being disciplined as athletes, but he's talking about how athletes are disciplined. And he's saying in the same way, make sure that you're disciplined spiritually so that you thrive spiritually and so that it overflows into every area of your life. In fact, we, we see it in the very next verse. He says this, 1 Corinthians 9, 25, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to, to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Right? Right? And, and there are so many things we could say here, so many disciplines that, that, we could, that we should focus on in our lives, but not athletic disciplines necessarily, but spiritual disciplines. That when we add those to our lives, we'll thrive spiritually. And we'll see the overflow into all the other areas of our life, which is so important for us as believers. 
So today I want to focus on one of those. In fact, my title comes from, from what Paul is saying in the next verse. He says, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 26, he says, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I think everybody knows what that is, right? You know, you're just punching in the air, some translations say. In other words, Paul's saying, hey, I'm not just going through the motions. I, I run with purpose in every step. I'm not gonna grow complacent. Why? Because I'm in a, I, I, I'm in a real battle. I'm in a real fight and I wanna run to win. Listen, man, this, this ain't no shadow boxing. This, this is my life. It's real, this fight. In fact, if we were to take this passage of scripture and, and reword it a little bit without the, without the term shadow boxing so we have a better understanding of what he's saying here, I think it would say something like this. So I run with purpose in every step. I discipline myself because I refuse to become complacent. I have a real opponent and I'm in a real fight, is what he's saying. Man, I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know about you, but the last three years have, have been super, super challenging for our church, and, and I know, it, honestly, I'm tired of, of mentioning the word COVID. <laughs> but throw on top of that, the economic situation, the political climate, and so much more, it seems like everyone has been feeling the same way. It's like, man, I, I, I'm, I'm so tired of this. I, I'm exhausted, I'm tired. And I feel it too, and a lot of people are saying, hey, I feel like, man, I feel like I'm just going through the motions. And I don't know if you feel that way today, but, but man, I, I'm with you on that at times. But, but here's what, ha what happens when we're tired, when we're exhausted and just going through the motions. It, we tend to be less disciplined, right? I mean, that's, that's the truth. And when we're less disciplined, complacency, complacency can make its way into our life. And, and complacency is so, 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 so dangerous for us. Because, well, mainly because complacency takes us away from the future that God has for us, it does. And those of you who've kind of, you know, had a season of complacency, you know what I'm talking about. And it's the truth. However, if we can discipline ourselves, and specifically disciplining ourselves spiritually, that will overflow into every other area of our life. Right? I mean, it's so key, so important. That's what Matthew chapter six says. Matthew six, 33 says, seek first God's kingdom and, and what God wants, then all your other needs will be met as well. I love that. I mean, we like to, we like to quote that scripture, but man, there's the application part of the scripture that, that, we, have to, that we have to understand and, and actually do if it's gonna work in our lives. But we do that. We do those disciplines and it's gonna overflow and touch every other, every other area of our life. And there's so much we can say about being disciplined and spiritually, but, but I wanna focus, today I wanna focus what, I'm, what, I'm, what I believe is a foundational discipline that will help, help us succeed spiritually. And that's the idea, this idea of, of taking steps. Because I think it's important that we're always moving forward. And, and the truth is, we all have room to move forward. I mean, honestly, if you're gonna, if you're gonna examine your life, we all, we all have room to move, move forward. I mean, let me just show you this list of things that will help us wrap our brain around the significance of having this discipline in our life, taking steps and moving forward. Because uh, taking steps and moving, moving forward brings us out of slavery and leads us to, to freedom, right? Taking steps and moving forward allows us to take new ground in our life. Taking steps and moving forward empowers us to confront enemies, not physical enemies, not people, but in a spiritual battle, right? Taking steps and moving forward promotes healing in our lives. Wow. Amen? Taking steps and moving forward spiritually leads us to our promises and the destiny that God has for us. And we cannot ignore that if we're gonna advance, if we're gonna grow, if we're gonna walk in everything that God has for us. And taking steps and, and, and moving forward spiritually leads us to, to, to what he has for. In fact, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel, they're coming out of Egypt, and at one point in their journey, they have the Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptian army behind them. I mean, we, I think we all know this story. And I mean, you can imagine 
how they're feeling in this moment, feeling trapped, feeling locked in, paralyzed. And I'm sure they feel that, that there's nothing that, that they can do. I mean, it's kind of almost a hopeless situation in their minds. But I love what God tells Moses in this moment. In, in the Bible says in Exodus chapter 14, verse 15, 16, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me about the Red Sea in front of you and the Egyptian army coming behind you? Tell the people to what? Get moving. I like to move it, move it. You like to? Ah, yeah, Madagascar, all right. <laughs> Put some movement in their life is what he's saying, why? Look, look here, why? <laughs> Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea, divide the water so the Israelites can walk. Here's why, so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. In other words, Moses, hey, tell the people to get moving so that they can reach the promise and the destiny that I have for them. And man, what a profound truth, because sometimes, maybe a lot of times, we get stuck. Sometimes we just stop. And for some of us, maybe we've never started. And, and this is my challenge. Let's get moving spiritually. Let's create this discipline in our lives so that we thrive spiritually and experience the overflow in every other area of our life. Because there's so many things I could say about this idea of taking steps, but, but today there's three that I'm gonna uh, focus on this morning that will be impactful when we apply this truth. And so the first one that I wanna challenge us with is uh, disciplines of taking steps and moving forward is, is take steps towards church. Hello? My church, I always say, amen or ouch. Amen or ouch. There you go. <laughs> and there's a couple of reasons why I wanted to address this topic. The first reason is because there's a difference between coming to church and being connected to church. And, can I, and I love technology. And what's so cool about technology is that we have this this whole other online audience and, and online congregation and technology has made that possible to, to be here, not just in the seats, but wherever you are. And, and we have a much bigger Tree of Life family because of our members who are part of this church online. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. And, and so, so there's a difference between coming to church on, online or in person and being connected to the church. And when I say connected, I'm not referring to virtually, but connected with our hearts, with our lives, with our, with our pocketbook, right? And it's, a, it's really alarming what the statistics are saying uh, about church attendance. I mean, pre-COVID, church attendance was already declining. But what COVID did to that is it, it accelerated it. I don't know if you know that, but the church today after COVID has had to adapt and look more and more at technology and ways to still be connected, to still participate and be an active part of a church family, a church body. But whether you're part of your, our, our online congregation or sitting in chairs every week, there are things that I think we wrestle with when we talk about taking steps towards church. And the question is, why is that difficult for us? Because for many of us, it is. I mean, I, there was a time in my life before I pursued ministry and, and finally decided to listen to God where it was difficult for me to have my family, to be in church, to have my family. And one of the things I think that we wrestle with is this, is this thought, our, our struggle with church, is I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I don't. And honestly, I have to say, yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> I, I have no argument against that thought. You don't have to come to church to be a Christian. And we don't go to church to become a Christian. That's a, that's a true statement. However, I do go to church, wh whether you're an online member or in person, because I, I go to church because church, church helps me. Are you there? Church helps me. Church grows me. I mean, where else can I, can I get that, that meat of the word? Where else can I get that training and, the, and, and what I need to, to have to grow spiritually? Church supports me. My church believes in me, supports me, gives me the tools I need to, to, to build my, my family spiritually, my, my life, to be the leader of my home and all those other things. Church gives me a place to belong to and a place to be known where I can be a part of a, a smaller community of, 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 of uh, people of faith that, that are gonna encourage me, which in church provides a healthy and strengthening community that we can be a part of. And that's why we're part of a church. Whatever that looks like for you online in a physical building with a group of people. In fact, here's the deal. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but you can't thrive as a Christian without being connected to the church. 
Amen or ouch? Not my words, but that's what we see in the scriptures. We were designed to do life together. And I know we hear this all the time. And, and we need the church because, all, because of all it provides in our life. And, and thank God for technology because more and more people who couldn't be connected can now be connected and be a part of a church. We need the church. And, and there's a popular meme going around social media about being a Christian in the church. And you've probably seen it. Uh, and if we could show that up there. If, if I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church was a photo, Right? I don't know if you guys seen that. I saw it a couple of weeks ago and I shared it on my, on my Facebook page because it's so true. And this is what the word says, Ecclesiastes 4.12. I love the Message Bible translation. It says, by yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. We need the church. Our life should be centered around our local church. Honestly, you know, when, 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 when I came back and, and realized that years and years ago before I, uh, I came back to, to God's plan for my life, I mean, we were there all the time. Our, our life revolved around church, honestly. Our kids were there all the time, youth and, and everything else. And, I, and I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but, but man, you gotta, you gotta think about these things. Because the, and, and, and that kind of segues into the next thing I wanna say, but, but I wanna speak to... The next thing I wanna speak to under this idea of taking steps towards church and hear my heart in this, because I think as parents, this is just such a real battle. It's a battle with families in my church. And that is, man, my kids have too many extracurricular activities for us to be involved in the church, all the social stuff we do, all this and that and this, the weekends and blah, blah, blah. In Mexico, there's literally soccer every night of the week and Saturdays and Sunday. I mean, you can imagine, you guys know. Uh, And soccer season never stops. Never stops. In fact, there are two seasons per year, two football, two soccer seasons per year with maybe, a, I think maybe a month break in between. And year after year is the same. Kids are growing up without the church. And when they get old enough, well, forget about it. Man, you know, they don't have anything to do with the church, with God, with anything. And it's no different here. Amen or ouch. And they're lost to the world, to the influence of culture that is completely anti-value, anti-family, anti-morals, anti-faith, anti-God, right? I mean, we're reaping the results of that today. I think we can all agree with that. Just when you think it can't get any worse, there's another policy being proposed, another law being passed that makes no sense and is damaging to, to our kids and our youth, and, right? I'm trying not to be political here, but I mean, that, that, is, that is what's going on. Can I get an amen? amen. Our kids grown up, and face a tough world. They're gonna grow up and be face to face up against culture. Oof. They're growing up, they're gonna grow up, hopefully, to be godly men and godly women. They're gonna grow up to be husbands and wives, moms and dads, workers in the workplace. But, and how are they going to be prepared for that in today's culture, in the culture of tomorrow? I have a soccer legend in my church, and he was a soccer star in Mexico. He scored uh, the winning goal in one of the World Cup matches several years ago um, for Mexico's national team. He was a star for Leon's professional team for years. He comes to my church, um, and some other players also come to, come to my church. And he's been really sporadic in attendance. So he actually, he, hasn't, he hadn't been in like months. And I would text him and text him. He wouldn't answer me. And, but he came one Sunday a couple of months ago and he wanted to talk to me. And he'd just been diagnosed with a, with a tumor in his brain. So I ministered to him. I laid hands on him, prayed for him, and I gave him this book on healing by Keith Moore. Best book on healing that I have ever read. And I think uh, in English, I think it might be 30, 30 Reasons Why It's God's Will for You to Be Healed, something like that. If you don't have that book, you need to add it to your library. But I told him I was gonna help him build his faith for this fight. And so I gave him this, this book, Keith Moore book. And he started studying this book and something really, really impacted him radically, radically. So we met again, we had coffee again. And he breaks down in tears about what he's learning about God and about healing and, and about everything, who he is in Christ. And, he, and he's telling me, Jeff, I, I thought I was a Christian. I've wasted all of these years and, and I thought I knew God. I'm learning that I didn't know him at all. I never had my kids in church. It was always soccer, soccer, sports, not just for me, but for my kids. And I don't know what, I don't know what, it, what to do now. 
but I know that I need to be in church. I'm so sorry for not being here and count on me to be here with my family every time the doors open. And he's been there every time. I mean, he's like, I, I can't even begin to describe the change in him. He's like so radically sold out right now. It's incredible. So he wants to get the whole Leon team saved. So, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, I'll, be, I'll have the opportunity to, to have a discipleship class with uh, the players here pretty soon through him. But he said something to me that I thought was profound for him to say. He tells me, Jeff, what won't prepare my kids to be success- successful in life, to be godly men and women, is how well they kick a soccer ball. They need to know God. I hope there's still time. I hope I'm not too late for my kids to know God because they're already, you know, teenagers. And please don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't have your kids in sports or anything like that, but make sure you don't let church be at the bottom of your priority list with your family. Right? And listen, we have to decide that our family's social calendar, sports calendar, extracurricular life is not more important than, than, than this heartfelt declaration that, that I see here in 3 John uh, 4. It says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Ooh. Man, may we all be able to say that. But we can't if we don't understand this, this discipline that, that needs to happen in our lives, in our family. All the parents in here, those of you, uh, those of us who have kids that are growing up to be, to be adults, there's nothing more true than that, nothing more important than that. And, and, but listen, in order for them to walk in the truth, they have to be led in that truth. Ouch. It matters that we take steps towards church. There's one other thing that I think we wrestle with, with this idea of taking steps towards church, and it's this. I have too much shame, and church feels uncomfortable. I've done too many things wrong. I've made too many bad decisions, and it's really uncomfortable uncomfortable for me to be here in church. I mean, let me tell you today, if that's the way you feel, I understand that feeling. I'm probably a lot of us do. But I want you to know this, that that's not the way God sees you. It's not. In fact, one of my favorite stories to tell is, with, is, is uh, to help us with this truth is actually the story of Adam and Eve. In the very beginning of Scripture, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate from the tree that they weren't supposed to, remember the story? The Bible says that God came looking for them in the, gar- in the evening of that night. And, and what did Adam and Eve do? They hid because they knew they had done wrong and they hid because they knew they were naked. But the Bible says that God sought them out, right? And he covered them and he clothed them, which is really a picture of him covering us with his grace and his love and his mercy and his forgiveness, right? That's the way God sees you. And here's what I know about this church, Tree of Life, my home church, the church I grew up in. I want you to know that you're welcome here. I want you to know that you're loved here, that you're accepted here, and that we're glad that you're here, right? This is the place you should be because we need, we need the church and we have to take steps toward the church. And another discipline, another step that we need to take in order to move forward, we need to take steps towards personal growth. We have to, we have to take steps towards towards spiritual personal growth. And and, and look, you're the only one responsible for your spiritual personal growth. I'm the only one responsible for my spiritual personal growth. And don't get mad, but but you need to understand that that Pastor Don is not responsible for your personal spiritual growth. Hello? Pastor Eric, Pastor Cody, Pastor Dick, your small group leader, no one else is responsible for your uh, personal spiritual growth. And I say that because a lot of times we put that responsibility on the pastor or the leader. Man, they need to feed me, feed me, feed me. And the pastors and leaders here, their responsibility is, is, to, is to create these environments where, where you can grow. But you're the one ultimately responsible for your growth. And so we've got to be taking steps. And, and what, is that, what does that mean? It means that we're taking steps towards feeding ourselves. It means we're taking steps towards new things in our spiritual journey. Maybe that's, maybe that's uh, uh, setting aside quiet time, reading scripture, worshiping, getting in a small group or jumping into a class. We're doing some new things. It means you're putting yourself in an environment that grows you, right? It means you're putting yourself around people who spur you on, as the scripture tells us. And there's a pastor that I listen to a lot, and I love his perspective on life and God's word. 
And he made this observation that I thought was so profound. He said, I know the areas in my life where I, where I have lessened my convictions, but I don't know of anywhere maybe that I've raised my convictions. I, I just think that, I, I think that's pro so profound. It's an important observation because that's human nature. Human nature is constantly lowering the bar, right? And I just want to challenge us. Hey, let's make sure that there are places that, that we're raising the bar, that we're growing, that we're maturing. In fact, that's exactly what Scripture encourages us to, encourages us to do. It says, Hebrews 6.1, it says, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings. So let's raise the bar in our convictions. Let's raise the bar. Let's grow in our life and let's move forward and be taken forward to maturity, says the word. And we've got to take steps in our spiritual growth. Why? Because we're not just going through the motions. Because we're not just playing around. We're not shadow boxing. And we're in a real battle with a real opponent and we're gonna run to win. Are you here? So we're gonna have disciplines, amen because disciplines lead to success. And then there's a third one that I wanna to speak to you and, the, and then I'll be done, and, it, and it's this. Take steps towards being all in. In other words, if there's anything in our life where we're on the fence, let's get off the fence and let's move towards being all in. For some of us, maybe that's in our priorities. There will always be things that are battling for the priority position of our heart. There just is. We know that. There will always be things that are battling and fighting for that first position in our hearts. I mean, uh, accomplishments, uh, achievements, family, work, uh, responsibilities, and all those things need to be a part of our life, but they need to be in the right place in our life. And it's Jesus above them all. For some of us, maybe it's in the area of our priorities. For others, maybe this idea of being all in, it means allowing God to speak into every area of your life. Because I, I know, probably most of us, we're okay with God. I mean, we're, we're here saying, ah, yeah, pastor, woo -hoo, yes, 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 yeah, God, every area of my life, yeah. But sometimes there's an area that we're still holding on to. A lot of times, I should say. Maybe today the Lord's just challenging you. Hey, let me speak into that area, Jeff. Let me lead you there, Jeff. Let me guide you there, Jeff. For some of us, maybe this idea of going all in has to do with our, our friend circle. Men are ouch. Why are you talking about my friends? <laughs> we tell this to our kids all the time, but it's true for us as adults. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future, right? If you've heard that. Maybe it's finding that friend that's gonna spur me on, that's gonna help me grow. And I, I don't know what it is for you. I'm just trusting that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now about what that may, might be right now in your life. There's actually a story in scripture. We know the story as, uh, as the story of the rich young ruler. And obviously in that story, the young man is rich, but he wants to know how he can enjoy his riches, riches and still have the promises of eternal life, basically. Well, Jesus, Jesus knows that there's a priority position issue in his life. And so Jesus challenges him to get rid of his stuff and come follow him. Well, if you don't know the story, you know that the young man couldn't do it. He couldn't part ways with his stuff. But what we have to recognize is, is this, what the real lesson of that parable is, that that parable is not a parable uh, against stuff necessarily. That parable is speaking to anything that has a higher priority than Jesus in our life, whatever that is. So I wanna challenge us to get off the fence and to be all in. In fact, I heard this story about a man who was sitting on a fence. God was on one side, Satan was on the other. And so God came over to this man and, and really encouraged him to come on his side of the fence. Hey, come with me and experience the life that I have for you. And the, guy, the guy on the fence was, was thankful for the invitation, but he really liked the idea uh, of being near Jesus and God, but also being near the world as well. And God begged him to come. And the guy on the fence was like, no, I think I'm good right here. Then the devil came over and he, he did the same thing. He tried to convince the guy to come over to his side of the fence and the guy knew not to do that. And the only difference was that the devil didn't beg him. He just kind of turned around and walked away. And the guy on the fence yelled at the devil and said, hey, aren't you gonna beg me? The devil looked over his shoulder and says, nah, I, I don't have to, I own the fence. <laughs> Oof. I don't wanna be on the fence. I don't know about you. I don't wanna be on the fence. I wanna be all in. I want us to be all in. Paul's terminology, I love it, I love it. Run to win, I run with purpose with every step. 
every step. I'm all in, so let's be all in. And I want to challenge us today, like God challenged Moses and the children of Israel. For some of us, we've never started moving spiritually, but that's okay. But let's start today. Some of us, we've grown stuck. And if you're someone who's grown stuck spiritually, I, I would say, try something new. Try something different. There are so many opportunities here. So many opportunities to do something. Not just in your personal life, but, but corporate, corporately. As a body. And other of us, others of us, we just, we intentionally stopped. So let's, I just want to encourage, let's hear the word of the Lord today. Let's, let's get moving and experience the promise and the destiny that God has for us. Can we do that? Can we do that, church? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we just stand and go to the Lord in prayer? Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you for the word today. I thank you for encouraging us. God, I thank you for motivating us. I thank you for maybe showing us something that we really need to evaluate and adjust in our lives. God, help us with that adjustment. Help us, God, to make that switch to where we are all in, to where you are the priority, God, to where everything that we do revolves around you and and the connection that we have with what you've, with, with the plan and the purpose that you have with the local church and our part in that. Help us understand and see the importance of that, the significance of being involved and participating and taking the steps forward to be, to grow spiritually. And we know that this is a part of it. What we do here every week, every time the doors are open, every class, every prayer meeting, all of those things, God, that you have made it so easy for us to grow and to be involved and to participate and to be connected in your plans, purposes, in, in, in the destiny that you have for us, God. We want to walk in that. Help us to make you the priority. Yes. 